What is a chemical pregnancy or a biochemical pregnancy? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. So I am a fertility doctor and I talk about fertility every single day. This channel exists so you can learn more about your body. So please subscribe and follow along so we can share more knowledge about your body to more people. Today, I wanna to talk really quickly about pregnancy loss, specifically a biochemical pregnancy and what it means and what it is, because I hear a lot of mixed messages and maybe my take is different as a fertility doctor based on the population of people that I care for. But there are things that I want you to know about pregnancy loss in general. So just to remember, what is a pregnancy test? A pregnancy test is typically a urinary based test where you're checking for HCG. HCG is the pregnancy hormone. So when you get pregnant, what is happening is that you ovulate and you ovulate and that egg has about 24 hours where it can be fertilized by a sperm. After it is fertilized, it then travels through the fallopian tube to enter the uterine cavity because fertilization happens in the fallopian tube. What happens is as that embryo moves into the cavity, it arrives into the uterus around days five to seven after ovulation. And that's when you have this short period of time when implantation can occur. After implantation, the embryo is going to start to invade into the wall of the uterus and start to make HCG. When that HCG gets into the bloodstream, that's when you can detect a positive pregnancy test. And so in general, you can usually get a positive pregnancy test in your urine around four weeks pregnant, which is essentially a week after implantation, two weeks after ovulation, or four weeks from your last period if you ovulated on cycle day 13 or 14 or two weeks in. Pregnancies, remember, are dated very strangely, and that's because before we knew when ovulation happened, before we had ultrasound, people were only able to know when the last person's period was. And because the average period is 28 to 29 days, just four weeks, people would say, oh, my period was four weeks ago. That would be how you would date a pregnancy when you missed a period. Anyways, we still use that terminology to keep pregnancies consistent, but understanding that if you have 35 day cycles or you ovulated really late, it's a little bit different from your last period day. But if we take it from the moment of implantation, you ovulate, has to get fertilized right away, has to implant about a week later, about a week after that, you can first get a positive test. Now, a clinical pregnancy versus a chemical pregnancy. A chemical pregnancy means you got a positive HCG test, whether it's blood or whether it is urine. Blood tests for HCG are much more sensitive purely because when you are checking a urine test, there's other things that can influence it. Namely, if you are really hydrated, maybe the urine can be more dilute and the concentration of the HCG hormone is not high enough to be detected on some of the commercial assays. The level on each of those tests that tell you pregnant or not pregnant is different, but typically it's usually around 20 of HCG versus blood tests can tell you about anything. So a chemical pregnancy by definition is having a positive pregnancy test, but losing the pregnancy before you get to the stage where you can clinically see a baby or a pregnancy on the ultrasound. So that would mean you get a positive test, you're pregnant, you have all your pregnancy symptoms, which are those same high progesterone symptoms, nausea, fatigue, sore breasts, but then you start bleeding a week later and you've miscarried, but by the time you go see the doctor, there's nothing in the uterus. This is gonna be considered a chemical pregnancy. A clinical pregnancy is when you can see a baby on the ultrasound or at least a gestational sac. So if we think about it and we use our timeline, here's a period, you ovulate at two weeks, implantation's a week after that, pregnancy test is a week after that, you're at the four week mark. It's about six weeks, so two more weeks before you can have that clinical pregnancy and see a pregnancy on ultrasound. That's when you know a pregnancy is in the uterus. After this, you can still lose a pregnancy, although the odds of losing a pregnancy do decrease significantly if you've had a positive heartbeat on the ultrasound, then your odds of miscarriage drop to five to 10%. Overall, you've probably heard the statistic, one out of four, usually about a 25% chance of miscarriage, but we do know that one of the top causes of miscarriage, both chemical and clinical, 
is age. So as you get older, your eggs have been sitting inside the vault in the ovary longer and there's more genetic abnormalities, meaning more of your eggs are not normal. They might implant, but then your body recognizes that something is off and you end up miscarrying. So the miscarriage rate increases significantly when you're age 40, it's about a 40% chance versus closer to 20% when you're 30. So higher rate of miscarriage, as we get older, also why we see lower live birth rates as we get older. So clinically, once you've seen that heartbeat, the chance of a miscarriage drops, but it's not zero. You can still have a clinical pregnancy loss, but if you don't have a fetal pole develop, that's considered just the gestational sac, a blighted ovum, an embryonic is the medical definition. So the pregnancy, the placenta developed, but you never had the actual baby develop. You can also have what we consider a pregnancy of unknown location, or an ectopic pregnancy. So an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy outside the uterus. A pregnancy of unknown location or a PUL is you have a positive pregnancy test, but you don't see the pregnancy. So you come in for that six week scan, but there's nothing in the uterus, but you also don't see a pregnancy in the tubes. So you don't have an official definition. Typically in these cases, your HCG level hasn't risen normally. There's usually other signs that go along. A lot of PUL, it's either just failed development of an intrauterine pregnancy or it is a tubal pregnancy. And sometimes you don't ever get the answer. You just have to treat it and make sure that it resolves. A lot of PULs are early ectopic pregnancies that are not seen. So a chemical pregnancy. Traditionally, when we talk about recurrent pregnancy loss, people are not including chemical pregnancies. And that is really frustrating because if you're trying to get pregnant, and you're going through chemical pregnancies or chemical pregnancy loss, it is still very upsetting. It's emotionally exhausting. And then to go to a doctor and have somebody say, well, that doesn't count in the definition of a recurrent pregnancy loss. And I have a different take on this. Part of it is that, well, we don't know that those pregnancies were in the uterus. A lot of tubal pregnancies, so an ectopic pregnancy, will just naturally miscarry and would be a chemical pregnancy. It started to implant. You can't get good placentation in the fallopian tube. So you start to have a miscarriage. So you don't know that it's a uterine issue in those cases, but you also don't know that it's not. Also, the rate of chemical pregnancy is very high. So there was a very famous study done, incidence of early pregnancy loss in the New England Journal of Medicine, like back in the 80s. And what it showed us is that when they use an extremely sensitive assay for HCG, there was a high number of pregnancy losses before people even would have missed a period. Meaning if you were waiting till your period skipped to test, you wouldn't even have known you were pregnant. So in this study, 31% of people had an early pregnancy loss, but 22% of these would have never known if they were waiting for their period to come because they started to implant and it failed. So chemical pregnancies do happen at a higher frequency. That doesn't mean that they're not important. So interestingly, an IVF study, with an IVF, obviously we know when implantation's occurring, we get a lot more data. Looking at people who had recurrent biochemical pregnancy loss versus clinical after IVF, the etiologies of the loss were very similar. Meaning the traditional workup that we do for recurrent pregnancy loss, which is parental karyotype to see if there's a genetic abnormality, autoimmune or clotting disorders, those things were still at a much higher prevalence in the chemical pregnancy loss rate group as well as the clinical than the people who didn't lose any pregnancies. So it wasn't as high as the clinical, but still impressive. So many of us, especially in the fertility world, will count your chemical pregnancies when we're looking at your full picture if we need to do a recurrent pregnancy loss workup. And I don't think it's wrong to ask for that because ultimately, what is the workup? It's some blood testing for a karyotype or your chromosomes and your partners for autoimmune thyroid disease, a TSH, looking to see if you have any clotting disorder, specifically antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And then it's looking to see your anatomy. Like do you have a uterine septum, which can cause miscarriage or pregnancy loss? Is everything normal inside the uterus and the tubes? Ultimately, what the early pregnancy loss study did show us is that most of the people who had these early unrecognized pregnancy losses or these chemical pregnancies did go on to get pregnant naturally without intervention within two years. So if you have one chemical pregnancy, am I thinking everything is wrong? 
No, I would say chemical pregnancies can be common. I'm not going to be worried about this. However, if you are having recurrent chemical pregnancy loss, I would definitely want to present to a doctor because there could be something underlying. Overall, what else can we think about if you're having recurrent chemical pregnancy loss, genetics, autoimmune, clotting disorders, anatomy issues, are they ectopic pregnancies? And then what about like inflammation and environment components? Those are things that we don't have as much data on, but we do know that metabolic conditions, things like PCOS, can also increase the rate of pregnancy loss. So making sure that you're being your healthiest self, you're avoiding toxins, you're decreasing inflammation in the way that you can. I have a recent podcast episode going into diet and miscarriage risk based on a recent study. And the news there is that eating healthy whole foods, fruits, veggies, whole grains, lowered your miscarriage risk. Things like processed foods increased it. So what you eat obviously does have a relationship to miscarriage. So it's not that diet can cause miscarriage, but definitely it appears that you can help reduce your risk if you're making healthy choices. We know that biochemical pregnancy losses happen. They are hard. If you are having one, I wouldn't draw big conclusions. But if you're having recurrent chemical loss, that's something I would definitely bring up to a doctor. Since we do know that in IVF studies, some of the etiologies are the same. I would want an evaluation at that point if it was me to try to see if we could get more information. Hope this video helped you learn a little bit more about your body and what's a chemical pregnancy loss versus a clinical and just some of the terminology that we use. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD, or you can listen to the As A Woman podcast for more information. Thanks friends.